Well, folks, um, today I am delighted to have one of my favorite people and favorite real estate investor on the channel, Michael Zuber. Thanks so much for joining us. Aaron, yeah, absolutely. I love, I love having talking real estate, love talking mortgage, love talking, you know, how, how can you use those two things together to, to change your financial future? So thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, thanks for the time. So before we get into it, you know, of course, as you know, I have like a, a billion questions and it would definitely go over a half an hour. <laughs> if we had. But um, before we get into it, tell maybe tell the audience like what you do, who you are and you know, stuff like that. Yeah. So uh, my name is Michael Zuber. I live in the Silicon Valley. I've been here my whole life. Uh, my journey with real estate doesn't start until I'm 30. Uh, after losing lots of money in the stock market, I was crushed by the dot com crisis. And uh, I remember being defeated, stressed out. I lost 80% of, you know, uh, what we had at the time in the crash. It wasn't a good feeling. And lo and behold, we, we go to a bookstore. Yes, a physical bookstore. I am that old. And I find Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Uh, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I go, huh, rental properties. I, I, should, I should look into that. Fast forward a year or so, I buy our first rental property in Fresno, California, which is two and a half hours away. And, um, you know, we buy that in 2002. Uh, we ride the wave up. We recycle some capital. We get to eight units. It's 2006 now-ish. And lo and behold, the Great Recession's right around the corner. I go to a meetup and see Bruce Norris. Bruce Norris is uh, an amazing uh, individual. I think he's in Florida now. At the time, he was in California. Uh, rest in peace, his uh, his son, Aaron, who was a good friend of mine, uh, yeah. who, I, who I miss to this day. Uh, but that one uh, real estate meetup changed my life. Uh, we did some 1031 exchanges out of houses into apartments. We go from 8 to 80 units. The crash happens. My houses that I had fell 75%. So to all the crash bros, <laughs> I have lived through a crash. I know what a crash is like. I have sold homes at a peak of a crash. We're not set up for it today. So I get it and I took action and I would again, if I saw a crash coming and then the bottom goes in and then we buy a whole lot of units. I borrow millions of dollars, private money, because at the time mortgage, I couldn't get a mortgage from a bank or a mortgage broker, right? Because in 2010, I was the devil. I was evil in the bank's eyes because I was an investor. Mm -hmm. So at the time they capped us at four loans. I clearly had more than four loans. So I had to find another way. So we go about borrowing millions of dollars, paying 10 to 12% interest only to friends and family. And we buy lots of stuff. And long story short, after 20 years of investing, uh, we retire. And uh, I've been given back on my YouTube channel, wrote a book, on, a best-selling book on Amazon uh, called One Rental at a Time. And, you know, kind of the rest is history. Yeah. By the way, folks, for those of you who are watching, uh, and I know a lot of folks watch in the beginning and then they'll stop watching. So for those of you watching this right now, go to the description box below and click on the link and go to Amazon and buy his book. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's changed my life. He has multiple books now, but that's mm -hmm. where it started for me. And yeah. Um, yeah, there's many real estate mentors out there, but um, if you're not following Michael, you should be. Um, it's just, yeah, he's a true professional. And yeah. We're going to get into some of those things here, but yeah. So I love this story. Um, I think it's one thing that stands out to me is that you don't have to be born into riches to be a real estate no. entrepreneur. Um, you know, of course, Anna Kelly is a great example of that, right? I mean, she's yeah, <laughs> yeah so one of my millionaires every week. Anna Kelly grew up in Section Eight housing, and um, you know, she's a multimillionaire now. It has a great story. The one thing I really appreciate about Anna Kelly is she. Um, she tells you if you want it, how, how to do it. And she will tell you to this day, and I've asked her on record, what was her best financial move? And that was selling the big home in Texas, buying a two-story fourplex in Pennsylvania, living in the upstairs unit and house hacking when she had two kids. I want you to think about that. You're living in a, call it 3,000 square foot house in Texas. Big payment, but you got it, right? You made it. All your friends think you made it. You sell it to go live in a small, dinky two bedroom with you and your husband and two kids upstairs in Pennsylvania where it snows, by the way. And mm -hmm. the only reason she survived the Great Recession was because she house hacked and lived for free. Everybody, everybody can do it, whether you want to or not, that's on you, but you can do it if you want to, right? If you want to bad enough. 
for those who might be watching this, who are like just barely getting into this, they want to invest in real estate, they don't know anything. What is house hacking? House hacking is basically where you purchase a home owner occupied. So you would get an FHA loan, possibly three and a half percent down, uh, possibly a 5% conventional loan, right? They would come to someone like you. And then you have these things that you could either call roommates, which is something Spencer Cornelia uh, and Todd Baldwin do. Both have been on my channel. Or you buy multiple units. You live in one, no roommates, but you have somebody paying the rent in the duplex or the triplex or the quad. Um, so basically it's, it's, you know, having somebody else pay your mortgage. Dion, one of my millionaires on my channel, uh, he is famous in my world because when you ask him what his monthly living cost is, like what is your rent? What is your mortgage payment? He chuckles, literally chuckles and says it's negative 2,100. <laughs> so he is paid $2,100 a month to live where he lives. Folks, that is house hacking. He house hacks a fourplex. Amazing. Yeah, that's incredible. I, I love it. it. One of the things that stands out to me is like a lot of the stuff that I'm hearing right now, but I know you're probably hearing this too. And I wanted to bounce this off you. So mm -hmm. as you know, a real estate mentor and an investor, what do you say to someone who has fear about investing today with rates where they are and with prices where they are? Again, for me, it all boils down to what's on my hat. Do the work. Um, fear, riskiness, all of that goes away if you know what you're doing. And what does that mean? That means go get a buy box. Go look at the same set of criteria every day for 90 days. Document, change it, learn what average is. And then maybe what you find out is there are no good deals. But you do it with confidence. If you're going to sit on the couch and watch the crash bros and bury your head in the sand and not do the work, shame on you. There were crash bros that were calling 2020 housing crash. And I have this 50 year spreadsheet. It's now 52 years because we keep adding to it or 53 years, excuse me, that actually showed you that 2020 was the second best year ever, ever to buy a home with 2010 being the only other year that was better. I'm sorry. You are not going to have a housing crash when you have the second best affordability ever. Just do yeah. the math. Do the work, man. Stop listening to these idiots who live in their mom's basement, who don't own or never bought anything, who are getting rich off telling you what you want to hear. I'm going to kick you in the ass and say, go figure it out for yourself and do the work. Yeah. Maybe it's a good time. Maybe it's a bad time. But until you do the work, you have no idea. Yeah. And you talk a lot about uh, the, the specifics of doing the work, right, in, in your program and stuff, right? And some of that is just knowing your current market. What's in, yeah. what's in your current area, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's not that hard, but it, it bothers me where people will make these declarative statements. Housing has to crash 20%. It's gone up 40% in two years. So it has to fall 20%. Really? It has to? Why does it have to? Really? Why? 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 Because it's not fair. Really? Not fair? When, when, when did fair become a part of the calculation? I, I don't remember yeah. fair being a part of that. Yeah, it's a great point. Another thing that stands out to me, of course, is, is your calculator, right? With mm -hmm. the cash and cash return, which, which I love is a simple one. There's so many uh, yeah. real estate investors. They make it overcomplicated, yeah. man. Just... Yeah. <laughs> and I just like that number. It's like, hey, if you can see that yeah. you're analyzing a potential rental property and you do the work, and you look at the numbers and you say the cash on cash return, which is how much you're going to get, you know, how much you're going to make per month, mm -hmm. right? On this rental is really good. Whatever, how you, however you define that. Whatever really good then, is, right? For you, it's 10. Maybe it's you, it's 15. I don't, I, and I never judge. If you live in San Diego, California, and you're happy with a 4%, go nuts. I wouldn't do it, but I'm not you, right? You, you, you do you, but please do the work, man. Damn. Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, there's that famous quote from Warren Buffett where he says, education mitigates risk. Exactly. So it's like, where do you Repetition, start? Repetition, educate. Yeah, yeah, you start exactly. by getting good education. Now, you know this probably better than me. There's a lot of bad and misinformation out there online about real estate <laughs> investing, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's everywhere, <laughs> yeah. which is another there reason There might be more bad stuff than good stuff. Yeah. So um, that's another reason why I wanted to bring you on because I'm like, okay, this is somebody that I highly trust, right? My father always told me to study the pros and you can be a pro. It's not magic. It's no, not 
It's all repeatable. Have, there are no secrets. Yeah. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to be a solid real estate investor. Agreed. It's uh, you, you and I have talked about this before. It's very similar to becoming a good golfer or becoming a good guitar player. Uh, yeah. I, to it. me, to me, it's it, it, to me, real estate investing is that golf swing, right? So my personal story with golf, I grew up ridiculously poor. I did not pick up a golf club until I was like 25 or 28, something like that, right? I was in the sales career. All the sales guys met with clients on the golf course. Never done it. So I pick up a golf club. I'm naturally athletic. Hand-eye coordination is better than average. And swing in that golf club, the oddest, most uncomfortable feeling. I'm grounding the club. I'm bouncing over the ball. Right, all of these things. But you know what? I went to the driving range every day for 30 days. And by day 30, I was never missing the ball again. Now, it was still a draw and a slice and all of that, but I was making solid contact. That to me is building your spreadsheet, looking at your buy box every day. Then I got a coach who said, Oh, you're a little too square, a little more here, a little more there. But if, you know, in my world, if I would have had a coach day one, I would have given up because they would have said everything I was doing was wrong. But I got to a point where I was looking at the spreadsheet, the real estate market, the golf ball, where I could make contact every time. Now it's like, how the hell do I get that golf ball to go the right freaking direction? Because it's going this way and it's going that way. So yeah, it, it is to me. And then the beauty about what I teach and talk about is once you feel comfortable, you can take your golf swing from the driving range to any freaking golf course in the country. When you learn the skill of learning real estate, it is repeatable and it's age agnostic. You know, you could be 20, 40, 80, or 100. The skill is not lost. So to me, it, it definitely is a golf swing. Yeah, that's great. Um, what about like for those people right now that are saying, he said buy box, what is that? What's a buy box? <laughs> so buy box for me is the anchor of all of this. A buy box is two things. First off, it's my focus criteria. So I'll tell you my buy box from 2001. Fresno, California, 93703, three or four bedroom homes, two baths, two car garage, between 1,700 and 2,100 square feet. That buy box at that time gave me somewhere between 20 and 40 active listings. I looked at that for three years and only that. So a buy box is first permission to look, but most importantly, and where most investors fail, is they look at other things. Hmm. My buy box was single family homes in the Mayfair district. I don't look at fourplexes. I don't look at condos. I don't look at two bedrooms. I don't look at five bedrooms. Where most investors go wrong is they look at too much stuff and they get negative leverage. They don't learn. It's not a golf swing that's being practiced and repeated. Most investors not only don't have a buy box, but they don't even look at the same city. If you're a new investor and you're looking at Fresno, California, Las Vegas, Nevada, Austin, Texas, and Miami, Florida, just stop. You're not, you're not getting better. You're getting confused. <laughs> so a buy box is permission to stay focused. It's everything, like it's everything yeah. for the beginner. I love that. I, the way that I've thought about a buy box is it's almost like a set of binoculars. You're like, I'm going to get it's, focused and I'm not going to look at this other stuff. I'm just going to yeah. look right here. Yeah, th that's it. It's it's like a microscope maybe, right? Because you can't move a microscope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love it. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Okay. Um, well, let me see. There's, there's so many directions we could go here. Um, so if folks want to start today, of course, you know, in terms of loans and stuff like that, what, what are you thinking about today in terms of, you know, getting a loan and, you know, let's say, let's say you start, you start today. Let's say Michael mm -hmm. Zuber has no rental properties today. Where sure. are you starting? Where, what are you thinking? Well, one of the first persons you got to reach out to is a mortgage broker that you trust. Cause you got to figure out a, can you qualify? If you can, what, what things can you qualify? You should probably also know what do you want, right? Are you going to house hack as we talked about earlier, whether it's roommates or units, are you going to do 20% down? Are you going to buy in state out of state? So you got you got to figure some of that out. But getting involved with the mortgage broker right up front is important because the last thing you want to do is do the work, write offers, and then not be able to get a loan. Um, a lot of people make that mistake. They just they assume, oh, Michael, I got an 800 credit score. I know I can get a loan. Well, maybe. 
At, do you, what's your debt coverage ratio? What's your, what's your, it's, it's, I think a lot of people are surprised because they don't work with a mortgage broker first. Hmm. Okay. So you're starting there. Now I know, of course, as you know, that there's these different types of loans. You've got, you know, like we love um, Velocity, right? Mm -hmm. We love uh, Stephen Dow at Velocity, which is non, you know, it's a non QM, -QM loan yeah. and stuff. Would you start there if you were starting again today? No, um, of course not. I would go with cheaper FHA conventional loans. You know, uh, okay. non QM would be, it would always, it's the key to real estate investing is to build out your Rolodex. So Stephen Dow and or a non QM lender, probably multiple, would be in my Rolodex. But in reality, I want the cheapest rate. And yes. non QM lenders aren't the cheapest rate. And if I have zero properties, I can go get four at least. Fannie Freddie loans, that would be my goal. And frankly, I would try to get seller financing first, but that's a different story. Okay. Yeah. And I think that could be very good for some people. Do you see with your experience thus far, you know, how, how many years have you been in real estate? 22 years? 22. Said? Yeah. Oh, so now 23 years, but yeah, splitting hairs. So if you were having to, you know, make a decently good educated guess, if you look the next 12 to 24 months, like do you sure. see rates going significantly higher or lower or staying the same? I think rates will be sub six by April 15th of 2023. Okay. That's owner rock, best credit, 20% down. You know, basically what mortgage business daily or mortgage news daily, whatever it is, quotes. I think, mm -hmm. uh, I think inflation is winning. I think the consumer is scared, which means they're going to pull back. I think a recession is in the offing. Uh, I think we will get to the terminal rate very quickly and thus the margin between the 10 and 30 year will collapse. Uh, so I think we'll be sub six in the next 30 days. Interesting. Okay. And would you say it's good wisdom to sort of think about interest rates as like a non-controllable, but your offer price is a controllable? How do you think about Absolutely. like those things? People always, you know, when, when rates were shooting over 7%, they're like, what are you doing? I'm like, Guys, cost of capital is one variable. It just goes in the spreadsheet and I offer less. I mean, I, I don't know why you guys are making this so hard. I've been doing this so long. Uh, I, and again, I think I said this earlier. There was a time in my career I had to pay 12%. I paid 12% on well over a million dollars. It made the deal work. Without that 12% money, I couldn't have got the deal. I'm happy. I'm happy I had every 12% loan. I wish I had more. Yeah, but I, I couldn't find enough deals to support 12% money for me. Yeah. And again, I say this, um, uh, that's how investors should think. I am not so callous that, that owner rocks. It's, it's tough. Owner occupants, tough affordability is, it, you know, where 2020 was the second best year ever. 2023, mm -hmm. at least at 7% was the second worst year. There was a worst year. It's called 1981. But it's a horrible year. I'm not confused. Um, it will get better as rates come down. It will get better as wages go up. Mm -hmm. But that's a slow process. So do you think that you would you would anticipate, you know, potentially prices in certain geographic areas coming down? Or do you think we're just going to be on a slow incline? Again, I don't, I don't know enough about any one area other than Fresno, California, to be specific. I talk national average or my market of Fresno, California. I think there's no question that iBuyers distorted some markets, Sacramento, Austin, Phoenix, Vegas, Nashville. Those have already come down and deserve so. But my call for the national median home price, December 22 to December 23, is up 1% to 3%, which drives people crazy. But <laughs> again, I don't care. That's what I think. And the last thing I'll say about that is I'm not an agent. I'm not a mortgage broker. I would like nothing less than a 75% crash. Like last time, mm -hmm. I unfortunately don't see it and I won't say things I don't believe. Yeah, I love that. Um, let's see. So another piece of this, something I love that you talk about, which I know you coined this term, but people watching this don't know this yet. Mm. What is an alligator property? <laughs> yeah, one of the <laughs> things you have with a buy box and learning what all of this is you avoid bad deals. And saying you have a bad deal is not painful enough. So if you ever buy my book, One Rental at a Time on Amazon, there's only one picture in the book. And it's a picture of an alligator, a friend of mine named Tom, shout out Tom for creating it for me, is an alligator eating a bag full of money. So when you create negative cash flow, 
or an asset that you have to feed every year, I want you to think of it as an alligator. And if you have an alligator, your job is to get rid of it. It just is. You should never feed your properties. Alligators are bad if there's any confusion. Okay. Love it. Um, next one would be about being a landlord. Okay. What are some major, cause you know, so many people when they're going to become potentially become a landlord, they think about it. They're like, Oh, I'm going to become a landlord. Oh my gosh. That's so scary. So maybe speak to that. What are some big potential pitfalls? What are some things that seem like a problem that aren't yeah. speak to being a landlord? Yeah. So there's one of the first pivots and I only can answer one of these two choices. Are you going to self-manage or hire a property manager? I of course chose to hire a property manager and that's not necessarily easier. It's a bigger control point because you only have one. Uh, and as I wrote in my book, I fired the first four. So clearly I had work to do. Yeah. Uh, but when you work with a property manager, your job is to set expectations, follow up, uh, approve any exceptions, but your time commitment is very low. I have never interacted with any of my tenants, nor do I plan to ever. That's my property manager's job. I pay them a lot of money to do that. Some people choose to property, uh, do self-management. And I would ask you to reach out to Lumberjack Landlord. He does that better than anybody I know. Um, but to have that conversation, you would need him. So if you're going to do have a property manager, again, set expectations, set a schedule of communications. I suggest once a week, have a 15 minute phone call. Uh, and then I generally say um, you get one mistake, but not two. Right. So I was just going to ask you, so what would be some major reasons why you would fire a property manager? Uh, lying to me would be a reason. Stealing from me would be a reason. Mm. Um I, I fired one property manager because I drove up on a Saturday to see a property and it looked great. I drove back the next day and it looked like crap. Basically what the property manager did is told the tenant, hey, you know, the owner's coming. Get get your car off the lawn. Pick up your debris, blah, 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 blah. And the very next day or maybe it was the next weekend, I drove back without telling them and it looked like crap. So when at the end of the day, it's your property, they are your servant. Uh, but yeah, it, 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 your job is to manage the PM and there are some amazing ones out there. Uh, but being a property manager is a very hard job. So um, yeah, it's a hard job. Okay. Yeah, I've said that too, that there's seem, of course, there's a cost, right, to, to being uh, in that position where you allow for a property manager. For sure. But you've got to put those into your numbers as you do the work, right? Um, Absolutely. A piece of it. And again, I just, yeah. you know, I paid 10%. Day one, when we had one house, we were paying 10% of rent. So that just had to go in the calculation. We don't pay that today, but that's what we paid when we began. So, yeah. Nowadays, have you been using, say, like the same one or more property managers for many, many years because you trust them? or do you? Yeah, switch? so I've had the same single property manager for seven years. There was a time where I took our portfolio, cut it in half, gave half and half. Um, but the other one um, disappointed me and I, I put it all with one. Okay. And then in terms of tenants... What would be some things, you know, because there's the classic example, right, of like a beginner who's never invested and they're like, I don't want to be getting phone calls for toilets in the middle of the night and so forth. What are some The good news is I've never that... gotten one of those phone calls because, again, I pay somebody else to take those phone calls. But what I would tell you, mm -hmm. all landlords, and most people don't understand this, you want to have, you want to reduce the risk of having bad tenants. Mm -hmm. Do your job up front. Too many people. Too many rookie landlords take the first application. They take the first sob story. They take the first this or that. No, create a tenant criteria, three times income, credit score, references, and never waver. Never waver. Everybody goes through the same thing. When you do that, your chances of getting a, a qualified tenant go up. Most landlords, certainly in the beginning, uh, they have a soft heart. They listen to the sob story. I take the first tenant that checks all boxes and I don't make exceptions. I don't make exceptions so far. Yeah. And again, some people have snuck through. Some people have been great for five or six years and then life happens and then they suck. It's not like I don't have evictions. I do have evictions. Um, but most landlords need to own up to doing a better job of tenant selection. 
Yeah, 100%. I think, you know what, in that same spirit, I, I tend to think to myself, um, when you're a landlord, you have to think of this like, this is a business. Correct. Right? Correct. <laughs> And the moment you let your heart get involved, then there's a possibility that this person or group of people are going to walk all over you. Oh, there's no, no, the answer is they will. The only question of when. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, Hey, that's great. I, I mean, I know we're at the 25 minute mark here. I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful for all this stuff. I know we could talk for hours, but, um, Michael, where can people find you? Yeah, I would say if you want to get some more, you know, brass tack stuff, come to my YouTube channel, One Rental at a Time. If you want to read a story of going from 80% uh, loss to, to something, pick up the book on Amazon and, of course, the website. All, all Everything's One Rental at a Time. Yep. Folks, everything will be down in the description box below. Uh, his Amazon link there, as well as the link to One Rental at a Time. If you have not yet liked and subscribed One Rental at a Time, please do so and, you know, look, uh, check for him on Instagram as well. Thank you, buddy. So, hey, thanks, Mike. Talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.